How would you respond if you heard it was going to rain every day for the next four weeks? <laughs> see, <laughs> see, the thing about it is how you answer today might not be the way you answer on another day uh, because what we've experienced would, would come into play. I mean, if we had had the wettest, rainiest six months in the history of the state, to find out we are going to have another four weeks of rain may just be awful news. Get in the car, drive south, just leave it behind, right? However, if we had just come off a record driest six months and, and forest fires are breaking out, threatening house and home, Four weeks of everyday rain could be welcome relief. Our previous experiences color our view of current events. And we need to remember that as we get into our text this morning. Uh, because here's the thing, uh, James is going to look at this issue of sin and one of the big takeaways he wants us to grab is when we sin, it's always our fault. Now, if you grew up in an environment that was domineering, legalistic, don't you dare ever make a mistake or else, sitting down in church on an already overcast, gloomy day and having the pastor say, we're going to talk about sin, and here's the punchline, it's your fault. <laughs> it, this is awful news. You want to get in your car and drive, right? Just get away. But if your previous experience, may, maybe you're coming off a three-week bender, a, a spiral where you have, you're at your bottom to hear what can I do? I, I know it's my fault. I, I need something. I need a way out. Well, this might come as a welcome relief. Point is, we are all going to look at this perhaps slightly different. And we need to remember it not only as we study, but as many of us are going to gather in community groups, We're all going to view it in maybe a different way. Some will be uncomfortable. Some will be at ease. And I'll just tell you full disclosure, I, it puts me in an awkward spot. I, I don't want to be that quarterback that like overthrows the receiver in such excitement, you know, that just... And I also don't want to be the quarterback that doesn't put any zip on it for fear of, you know, breaking a finger. Because the problem for me is, second full disclosure, I'm a pilgrim on the same journey you are. Just because I stand up here doesn't mean I've got this sin thing figured out. I, I, I'm preaching to myself as much as I would preach to you. My, my part in, in what we do it is to study this book, is, is to try to expound it and, and bring it to bear upon our lives, keeping in mind I didn't write it. I don't have it all figured out either. But my prayer is we all want to hear what he would want to teach us. This is supposed to be for our instruction. It's supposed to be good news. It's supposed to give us life. It's what we want to hear. It, it, it is why, and, and if you came in late and didn't get the announcement, you're like, have they not been paying the power bills? Why are those screens not on, right? Uh, this week, we, we are going to encourage you, and we'll tell you more, and it's in your bulletin, to, to take a media fast, to take a break from some of the noise and the voices that we can just hear all the time. And this subject, talking about our sin and how we fall into it, is one that can easily be heard with a wagging finger, and that's not what God 
wants you to hear. So we've even modeled it from up front where we're going to tune down the distraction so that we can hear God's love for us, God's heart for us, God's desire for us to live the victorious life his son Jesus Christ died to make available. I know some of you will still be a little twitchy. And so if I can, and even if you're visiting, this might be awkward, nothing will happen to you, but would you just bow your heads? And, and at, at every campus, just, just close your eyes for a moment and let me, if I could just speak directly to you, are, are, are you already uncomfortable? It's a trigger from your past. You, it, it, it's, it's where you're at right now. It, you don't want to feel like you're going to leave with a burden on your back. You don't want to leave feeling like you don't measure up. You just don't want to hear about sin. If so, and this would be a prayer of faith, would you maybe just say to the Lord, but you've, you knew God what this morning would be about. And in your goodness and love for me, you've got me here. So Father, would you help me to tune out the distractions, to take down any walls that would be a barrier and, and allow me to hear from you and what you would want to say. And Father, I pray that you would help me on the very same journey uh, that everyone else is on, uh, to teach your word, that we would hear it, and that, God, you would give us ears to understand. And I pray that it would cause life change in us because of our presence here together. Lord, meet with us and be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you have a Bible, turn to James chapter 1. Uh, we're beginning at verse 12. Uh, if you are kind of new to this thing, uh, James was the uh, younger brother of Jesus, uh, who at first wasn't really on the program. Uh, he, he didn't buy into Jesus' claims. And then he got on it and ended up being the leader of that first church in Jerusalem. And, and why we're studying this book is we want to learn practically what it looks like to love well, what it looks like to live the Christian life. And last week we saw James gave sort of what are four essentials, four things that need to be present if, if we want to love well. And it's endurance, uh, we need wisdom, we need faith, we need perspective. And now he turns his attention uh, not to what we need, but to what can knock us off our game. Our goals, if misguided, and our sin, if not kept in check, will keep us from living the kind of life that we in Christ are called to, and many of us, I think, would say, we desire to live. Verse 12, our goals. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. If you were with us several weeks ago, uh, we looked at Jesus, what we call Beatitudes, and this one starts surprisingly similar with this word blessed. Blessed is the one, and, and it's, a, it's an awkward word to translate into English now. You could almost say it means happy, but the way we use the word happy doesn't fit. It, it, it's almost like saying fortunate or getting to the point of have you ever seen somebody who maybe takes a fall and they get up and like a tooth is gone and they're like bleeding and you're like, are you okay? And they're like, it's all good. And you're like, it doesn't look like it's all good. <laughs> right? that, that's almost the definition. Even though visually from the outside, you would see someone and say they are not good because of Christ in their life. They can say, no, I, I am all good. Even though the trial seems bad, I'm telling you, I'm all good. Why? Because the man or woman who remains steadfast, who endures under trial, when they've stood the test, will receive the crown of life. 
And when you read Crown of Life, don't be thinking monarch. Be thinking like old school in the toga Olympian with a wreath around their neck. This crown isn't like the jewel encrusted gold thing on someone's head, picture of status and wealth. This is the wreath that's put around the neck of the Olympian who finished the race. It's a picture of endurance, of determination, and of final victory. James tells us that we who endure the trials of this life and stay steadfast, Jesus is going to put this wreath of endurance and victory around our necks. Uh, Jesus says this in Revelation 2.10, talking to some men and women who are going to be around in a time when there is going to be some serious struggle. And Jesus hoped for them, hang in there. Why? Because I'm going to give you a crown of life. Jesus thought... James's thought is that if we know the crown is coming, keeping our eyes on that goal should make a practical difference today. And motorcycle riders, they they know this. They're, they're, They're taught this, right? The bike will go where? Where you look. So look where you want to go. Uh, technically, it, it, it's, it's target fixation is what they refer to it. If there's a car coming over at you and you stare at that car, you're going to hit the car. If you focus on the pothole, you're going to get that bike and you're going to hit the pothole. So, so don't look at the coming car. Don't get your eyes on the pothole. Look for the way of escape. What's your way out? Our goals make a practical difference. And when the trials of life come, if you're focused on it, if that's what has your rapt attention, you'll hit it head on. So so get your eyes off the trial. What might you be fixating on? If you just look back over the last seven days, What had your attention? How many days could you say, you know what? The thing that had my attention was eternity with Jesus Christ, my Lord. I I, I didn't have many days that were filled with that. But looking all around at trifling others. Notice the sweet part is it's not just those who come in first but it's for every man and woman who endures. You finish the course. You love Jesus Christ. This is your future. The sad part is this means that every day counts. And I say sad part because if you're coming from that legalistic background, you're like, oh, great. So every day from now on out, I got like chances to fail and just feel awful again. And you know what? We do have chances to fail each and every day. But the flip side of it is, every day counts, no matter what trial I have to go through on Tuesday, my heavenly father sees it. Do you know that God says he stores up our tears in a bottle? Nothing between now and that day we receive that crown is lost on him. Every day counts. But if your eyes are on something else, it's easy to get knocked off. Why? Because we've got this problem this sin problem, and here's the thing, it's not God's fault. That's what he goes into in verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. James is wanting to correct what was obviously a misunderstanding. Let no one say when they're being tempted, they're being tempted by God. And he gives two reasons. Number one, God cannot be tempted by evil himself. God is morally perfect. He is not into evil as you and I enjoy it. Consequently, he wants none of us to fall. He wants none of us to stumble. So he will never tempt us to sin. Where it gets a little off-putting, though, is that we can read in the Old Testament, and maybe someone's told you this if you haven't read the Old Testament yet. Well, I thought God tested us. 
And God certainly does test us to strengthen our faith. But to test us is not the same to tempt us. Picture if you could like inexperienced young driver, but he's been saving up since he was 12 for his car. And, and then he finally has his sweet little ride, but he's inexperienced. And so then it's October 1st and there's a huge blizzard. <laughs> and mom comes down and says, hey, this, sweetie, you've never driven in snow. And, and I'm, this, this, this is it. Why don't you take your car and like go to the church parking lot or, or go to the mall and get a feel for what it's like to drive in the snow so that when you're out on the road by yourself, you know, you'll, you'll have a sense. Now, if the kid goes to the parking lot and gets really comfortable really fast and starts grabbing the e-brake and doing donuts, <laughs> if in doing donuts, he hits a light post and smashes his brand new car, he'd be hard pressed to come home to mom and say, you wanted me to crash. Right? Mom would say, I didn't want you to crash. I never want you to crash. I love you. I wanted you to get, a, I wanted you to know. I wanted you to learn. I didn't want you to wreck. So God is like that with us. Yes, he tests us to grow our faith, but listen, God is for you. He does not want you or me to stumble. He never wants us to sin and he will never try to get you or I to sin. Now this is sort of highly personal. Have you ever thought God was out to get you? Have you ever been in a spot where maybe you had, it's a spiral you can't seem to get out of it, and you've been like, God, what are you doing? Why can't I get a break? Now, we hear it, and a lot of us, I think, have grown up in church, and we're like, oh, no, no I, the answer to this is no. I'm just going to, like, straight face it. <laughs> Good. It's great. But here's the thing. Someone thought it. Maybe it was just James. But it hit him so real, he thought it best to write down to make sure none of us ever get this confused. Don't ever think when you're being tempted, you're being tempted by God. Because God is only for you. Maybe there's not very many of us who would say we've thought that God wasn't trying to help us out. But if you have, this is a time to be like, Lord, forgive me. And thank you for being for me. Because I'm telling you, God loves you. And he's for you. Our problem with sin is not his. This is where it gets fun. It's ours. Look at verse 14. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Notice James says, each person, every single one of us, this is how sin happens. So sweet little grandma that you love that could do no wrong, when she does sin, it's because her naughty little heart desires something and she takes the bait. And you know what? When you sin, when I sin, it happens the same way. This is what goes down. We have a desire and we are lured and enticed by that desire. And, 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 it's, and it's maybe in, it's a little more clear in the original, but what it is, it, it's, an, it's a fishing example. Any of you like to fish? 
James is talking about, and this, remember, this is pre-catch and release, right? This is that the, the fish sees the bait or, or watches the fly coming at it and has a desire. And that desire, that looks tasty, lures it and entices it to what? To bite. But James is like, the problem is when you bite, you're hooked. And it brings death. And he doesn't like put it out in a neat little outline. And it's sort of, he, he changes metaphors. And he goes from talking about fishing to this, this idea of conception and birth. Because he says, then desire, little fishy, seeing the, seeing the bait, feeling the desire, feeling the pull. Desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. The fish has the desire for the thing, bites on, and is hooked and ripped out and comes death. Now, talking about this subject is not one that we love. Especially when we're talking about us doing it. But since we already are, Let's just say a few things about how it works, since it's already awkward. Number one, we need to remember that not everybody is tempted by the same thing. But everybody, when tempted, goes through the same process. I like French fries with vinegar on them. I'm from Canada. (laughs) My dad likes pickled herring. He's from Europe. If my dad and I threw a party and served our favorite things and invited you, many of you are not worried about overeating that night. (laughs) Not your thing. But I suspect you could write down on the pages you're holding your hand something that if that was served, oh yeah, you're getting after it. We have different desires and likes The same thing happens with with sin. We're all tempted by not the same things. Have you ever noticed you tend to fall in a lot of the same ways? Satan and his minions are really outgunned when it comes to God. Satan and his minions are not omniscient. They don't know everything. And one thing you got to just make note of, Satan and his minions cannot read your mind. They have no idea what's going on inside of your head. So you pray those little prayers. They are between you and God the Father. But one thing that Satan and his minions can do is watch you and me. And it doesn't take much high IQ or really a whole lot of time to follow us around for them to come up with a game plan. Okay? Situation A, she didn't care. She walked right away. Situation B, you know what? A little bit, but not so much. But situation C, we had her. How much are they going back to A and B the next time? You and I need to be students of ourselves. We need to be willing to look into a mirror and acknowledge where it is We fall, and it might not be the way your friends and family fall. And that's hard. You might have a group of pals that they go out and do something, and you know they they can keep it together, but if you do the same thing, you know how it ends. I think this is why Jesus says in Matthew 5, when he's talking about if your eye, if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. He doesn't say, hey, everybody, tear out all your eyes. No, if your eye does, because someone else, that might not be a thing for them. But if it is for you, he says it's not worth it. Take some action. Do you know where you're weak? And if you do, here's the second thing we need to remember. 
Being tempted by something is not the same as giving into that temptation. Thinking I could wring their neck and wringing their neck are different. Jesus, Matthew 4, Jesus was himself tempted, but he never sinned. Satan came at him. Jesus stood strong. You and I will be tempted because of our naughty hearts desiring bad things. And when that happens, swim away. Because this is the thing I've sort of learned in my own life. From desire to doing the sin is not a linear stretch of time. Have you ever caught yourself being tempted with something and then you don't even understand it? Nine minutes later, you're like, I did it. Have you ever gone into an evening, I'm not going to do this, and then waking up the next morning thinking, I can't believe I did. When desire strikes, for the naughty thing. That's not the time to flirt with it. It's not the time to come up to the fly and see if you could take a little nibble. It's the time to swim away. This is the path God would have us take, which leads us to our third thing, which could be for some of us the best news you've heard all day. God will never let you or I be tempted beyond our ability. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, Jesus, uh, Paul writing says, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. This is... An incredibly sweet promise. Because what God is telling you and me is no matter what temptation you or I face, it is never, listen to that, it is never a guaranteed fail. God loves you and me so much that he sovereignly works that you and I will never be tempted with something that we will do it automatically. But he says he provides a way out. There's always a way of escape. And why this is so sweet is I believe because we're tempted by unique things, that tends to mean we do some of the same sins over and over again. Can I get an amen? amen? So when you fall in very similar ways, time and time again, and then you're faced with the same temptation, do you feel like you got it? No, no, it, it, it's, a, it's a Thursday. It's a brand new day. You haven't done that sin yet. But then the temptation comes and all the past guilt, all the past failures come into your mind. But you know whose mind they don't come into? God's. He's like, you got this, kid. You've got it. You have it. But Lord, so many times it doesn't matter. You have this. Walk away. Swim fast. There's a way of escape. And what's weird is parents actually get this. Have you ever tried to teach a kid to ride a bike? How many kids just hopped on and rode? Very few. Tumbles and falls. I can't do this. How many of you as parents, you know, spent the half hour and then actually just said, you know what? You actually do fall a lot. Just get a scooter. (laughs) 
No, mom or dad might say, hey, you know, okay, let's take a break. But tomorrow, get back on. You can do it. This is in you. And see, what's so special about it is we understand it about humanly parents, but actually parents don't even really know what's in us. God looks at you and me in the face of temptation, and he says, no, 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 no. Get back up. You can do it. You know why? Because my spirit is in you. I am for your victory. I am love you. I don't want you to fail, and you don't need to fail anymore. Swim away. And the unfortunate part is, I'm telling you, sometimes it's not pretty. I talked to myself about pulling a joey, which is in the Old Testament, there's this guy named Joseph. And Joseph was doing his best to live the life God had called him to live until some other guy's wife came on to him. And Joseph tried to talk his way out of it, which was a natural thing to do. It was his boss's wife, right? But then she tore his cloak off of him, which back then was a lot more clothing than it sounds like now. (laughs) And what did Joseph do? He literally just ran away. And that day... At that moment, he didn't sin. Some of us, we flirt with temptation. And we get hooked so fast. And then it's over. God loves you. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But you need to run from it. I need to run from it. Just to get honest, have you been taking the bait? You do not have to any longer. If you've confessed Christ as Lord and his spirit lives in you, you've got this kid. You can do it. Do not be deceived, James says. He wants us to not fall prey to the lies of the enemy or the lies we tell ourselves. Look at verse 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Do not be deceived. And then he says, beloved brothers and sisters. And, And this is on purpose. Read through James. He only says beloved three times. And he's not the kind of guy that wants to fill space. He really wants you and I to hear this from his heart. It's a Valentine's Day card type of moment. We say some special things. My beloved, do not be deceived. Do never, ever, ever think that God is working against you. God is only for you. God only ever gives good and perfect gifts. Christmas morning, gifts from God. No socks, no bad sweaters. Only good and perfect gifts from God. (laughs) He loves you so much. He doesn't want you to fail. And you wake up with your guilt and he is ready and willing with good, perfect gifts of grace. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ and it's how James ends. He says, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures Whose idea was the gospel? It was God the Father who asked his son to descend to this earth and give his life in our place. And that is the word of truth I would preach to you today. And I tell you, I'm jacked up in a lot of ways, but one thing I know is that Jesus Christ loves you. 
That is the word of truth. And you may be the first one in your family, but you may come from a long line. You are first fruits in his. You are not taking any less of him to save and you're not causing him any worry to save. He loves you. And he has given himself for you. And so when we wake up in a morning and our mind can be cluttered, our past failures, North Korea, homelessness and pain. It, it, we can come to a spot of despondency thinking, you know, the world is going south and I can't even live the life I want to. And if we're not careful... We can forget that for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but get the crown of life. Do you need to remember that? This idea of a media fast Stripping away the screens, not turning on the lights, is to try to mimic in our service what I would love for you to experience in the next six days. To strip away the voices, to strip away the marketing, to strip away the competition and rest and hear from the God who loves you and is ever for you and the temptations you face. Some of us wake up to a phone that buzzes beside our bed and before our feet even get out of that bed, we've checked our email, scrolled through different feeds and looked at the weather and we go on a jog, listening to music, and then on our way to work, it's a podcast or the morning show, all to get there and sit and look at a screen for eight to nine hours. And then we get home, and now we feel like we need a break from all of that noise, so we sit on a chair by ourselves and tune out a little, see if anyone else didn't like their job today. <laughs> and then we have a hurried dinner, where one person or two people, phones are on the table, and when it's all said and done, we're so exhausted. So let's just watch some television before we nod off to sleep. <laughs> and then we do it all over again. And God's love for us was displayed upon the cross and make no mistake, it was victorious because Jesus didn't stay dead, he got up. But I'm telling you from experience, sometimes that love today, it seems like but a whisper. And we need to sometimes turn down the noise so that we can hear his voice. You and I do not need to sin. He wants to tell you that this week. What would it look like for you to cut something out? Take some time and say, speak. Say, you know, you know, you know how I fail. You know my regret and you know my doubt about having any hope for the future. But you tell me there's victory. God, I do believe. Help my unbelief. Amen? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for displaying your great love for us before we had ever done anything that we thought was worthwhile and before any of us had ever actually sinned. 
uh, God, we were born into this, and you have sent your son, Jesus Christ, to get us out. Lord, I pray that as I, I pray that you kind of land this plane where it needs to land in people's hearts. Those that are coming from a legalistic domineering, don't ever make a mistake background, that God, they would hear grace and hear that you're for them and hear that you love them. But others who have maybe been uh, taking the bait far too often that they would hear they don't need to because of your spirit in them, they can swim away. God, give us faith and a strong measure of your grace to believe these things. In Jesus' name, amen.